a note here saying kuru means do it, do it now. Who wrote that? <laughs> yeah? Oh, so it's not like, please. <laughs> I suppose it depends on your mind. <laughs> Um, so maybe we can um, we can just recall the motivation that we generated earlier this morning, our motivation for being here, and um, really, yeah, try to feel the wish to be of benefit to yourself and others, as many other people and beings as you're able to bring into your field of awareness your positive thoughts and feelings and then think that's why you're here to learn how to be of benefit to others develop your own positive potential your positive qualities so you can be of greater benefit to others and to the world and if you're comfortable with the idea of attaining enlightenment to benefit others in the best possible way, you can bring that in as well. I was wondering with the hand mudra, is that uh, the, the positioning, does it have any connection to like the winds and channels and tantra? Which one? Oh, just one? the way that she's holding her. This? Yeah. Um, it might be, but normally, yeah, it said that it, um, actually I found some Yeah, I found some more information about white Tara. Oh, maybe I'll just read this. One is about the white, the seven eyes, white Tara's seven eyes. This is from Robert Beer, who's an um, amazing painter, Tonka painter. Um, so he knows a lot about deities and their symbolism. Uh, so this is a little different uh, explanation of the seven eyes. It says this. The three eyes on her face represent the perfection of her body, speech, and mind. Perfect body, perfect speech, perfect mind. And the four eyes on her palms and soles symbolize the four measurables. Uh, loving kindness, boundless compassion, sympathetic joy, and perfect equanimity. So that's, you know, another way of explaining those. Um, and then with the hand mudras, yeah, the right hand, she, she makes the open palmed boon granting um, mudra of supreme generosity. With her left hand, she makes, it's called the abhaya mudra of protection or giving refuge. So, no, I haven't heard, I mean, it could, but I just haven't heard that. And um, sometimes, not always, but um, yeah, the that hand, um, the left hand, holds the stem of this um, flower called an utpala flower, which is kind of bluish white, and um, the. Um, Oh, it actually calls it a lotus. It's a type of lotus, maybe. Upala is a type of lotus. 
and um, the lotus blossoms at the level of her ear and bears a fruit, an open blossom and a bud, representing the Buddhas of the three times, past, present, and future. So if you look carefully at that flower, there's actually three parts to it. One that's fully opened, one that's just a bud, and a fruit. Not in here. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's also the same with uh, green tar. I think um, she also holds the uh, stem of this blue flower. It has three parts to it, representing the th um, Buddhas of the past, present, and future. Um, maybe this morning you already said that, but I didn't catch it. Um, who are those who have attained the realization of long life? Are they like our I didn't or? mention it. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, they do talk about this in, um, like in Tantra. Um, part of the practice of, of Tantra involves attaining cities. Um, certain accomplishments or powers, and one of the one of the cities that's often this is Siddhi, not city, Siddhi, S I D D H I. Uh, one of those it has to do with life that you're able to um, extend your life for a really really long time, like um, even eons. <laughs> um, so it perhaps is referring to that. So people who've done that practice and accomplished that practice, and they're, they've attained that um, that city. I'm guessing. I don't know. And the second question I had was for the essence of the four elements. Were those like heat for fire? Is that the essence? Well, yeah. The, the four elements are earth, water, fire, and air. So when they say the essence of the four elements, I'm not quite sure what that means. But yeah, I, I just think kind of the essential energy, the essential qualities of those, which we bring in from outside to ourselves to um, strengthen the elements in our own body. That's that's how I understand that. That's one of the ways in which we can extend our life. And that reminds me too, there was, <laughs> I found this kind of blog, somebody collected all these different uh, stories and information and so on about White Tara. And there was a story about a woman, uh, either in Thai Tibet or China, and um, she was very ill. And the doctors told her, oh, 28 years ago, so 28 years earlier, she was very ill. And the doctors told her that she should get ready for death. And she met Garchen Rinpoche, who's a well-known contemporary lama. And he advised her to do the practice of white Tara every day. So she did that. And 28 years later, <laughs> she met him again. <laughs> she, at that time, she was 88 years old. So she must have been 60 when she you know, started doing the practice. So it, it enabled her to live another 28 years and um, still doing the, the practice. And Garcha Rinpoche advised her to um, share her story so that people could be, you know, could, could see the efficacy of this practice. So this is a contemporary story. Oh, and before I forget to, Venerable Children asked that um, when we are doing the practice of Waitara and dedicating the merit to the long lives of His Holiness and other teachers, that we could include Venerable Master Wu Yin and uh, Venerable Heng Cheng. So those are two um, fully ordained nun teachers we know in Taiwan. And um, both have come to the Abbey and taught, and they've both been very, very helpful in um, the monastic community here, learning the Vinaya and monastic life and so on. And Venerable Master Wu Yin is 80-something, more than 80. Hmm? He's up there. <laughs> yeah, so she's still 
going strong, I think. And yeah, but yeah, we we, we would like her to live longer. And Bo Heng Cheng isn't so old, is she? Oh, is she? She's even older. Heng Cheng. Oh, okay. So yeah, we would like them to stay healthy and live long. Their their photos are on the wall in the Kuan Yin room. If you want to have a look. So they, they're yeah, two Taiwanese bhikshuni teachers who've been very, very helpful for us. So in the sadhana, it mentions that Tara has all the signs and marks of a Buddha, but it seems like they're not necessarily depicted in the Tanka, I mean, literally. And... Mm. The other thing that I then got stuck on is one of the signs is explicitly about having a male body. So mm -hmm. is that anything you can comment on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. I don't know what to say about that. I mean... Um, Hmm. I, I do recall, I have to look it up, but um, during one class when the students were studying about the signs and marks of the Buddha, that question did come up about the male, you know, the male organ. And I think I, I'll have to look at the um, transcript to see what the teacher said. This was uh, Geshe Jamba Gyatso in Italy. Um, I think he said it does apply to female. It, it doesn't, you know, rule out um, male, uh, female bodies. It can apply to females as well. But I have to look to see exactly what he said about that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, these are the marks and signs of a Sambhalukaya. And I don't know. Yeah, is this image of Tar considered a Sambhalukaya form? I'm not completely sure. I'll see if I can find out information about that, but don't worry about it. <laughs> She's a Buddha. She's fully awakened, fully enlightened. There's nothing left out, nothing missing there <laughs> for her to be. It's interesting because I've heard that argued as why women can't attain Buddhahood. Is that one of the signs is explicitly about having a male body? Well, so clearly, you know, that people can take information. People, it's like you know, they say. You know, you can the devil can quote scripture. So if you, <laughs> you know, if you want to make a point about something, you can pull out information to support your case. So, you know, it's clear in, in tantra that that doesn't that doesn't count. You know, women can become enlightened, and in fact, I think Padma Sambhava said women can become enlightened more easily than men, something like that. So, this is other people who say that, but this is a practice from Vajrayana and in Vajrayana Buddhism that is not a that's just not uh, acceptable we can become enlightened don't worry <laughs> since the visualization of kind of purifying and removing negativities is so similar to Vajrasattva is it ever used as a purification practice or is it kind of more specifically for long life and health? Or? Well, I think, I mean, I have heard that when it comes to doing purification, you know, like if you want to purify um, some negative karma you've created, that uh, you can do any kind of virtuous practice. Yeah, It doesn't have to be Vajrasattva or 35 Buddhas. Those are the more common ones. But you can use any practice, any mantra. You can use Omani Padme Hum. You can use Buddhist mantra. So I, I think it would be fine to, yeah, use Vaitara practice, Vaitara mantra. I'm not really sure why Vajrasattva is so much recommended, um, why that is. But if all the Buddhas are equal, <laughs> all the Buddhas have the same qualities and abilities, then relying on white tara should be just as valid as relying on Vajrasattva to purify. That's my thought, but according to my understanding, but yeah. Early on, I struggled with Vajrasattva practice at the end of the day because it seemed to take more energy than I had at the end of the day. And I asked Venerable Chodron if I could 
substitute white tara for Vajrasattva purification practice? And she said, yeah, sure, kind of similar to what you're saying. So, yeah. so um, but one thing I wanted to um, add about the connection of Tara to uh, grief and grieving is that pre-Tibetan, um, like the earliest versions of Tara was a fierce um, charnel grounds deity. The earliest version of white Tara, Tara? or Tara, Tara, Tara in no, general? Tara. Tara in general. Like, yeah, all of Was a fierce, fierce charnel fierce, grounds? She was fierce uh, <laughs> in the charnel grounds. And yeah, Tibetans kind of like got her a public relations specialist and made her into <laughs> Made her very peaceful and everything, so it's an interesting conversion. Is that from the India, from India? Yeah, Veda, from the Vedas. Yeah. Yeah, because in yeah, um, Tara, the practice of Tara goes way back. Um, there's a book. What's it called? Um, by Martin Wilson. Um, not that, not one. Yeah, there's a book called The Cult of Tara. I haven't read that one, but another one. Mm, I can't remember. Songs in Praise of Tara, something Martin Wilson translated, um, lots of different texts related to Tara. So, um, yeah, he goes into the, yeah, yeah, um, Indian, you know, classical Indian texts related to Tara. And even a sutra, there was even one sutra, uh, including a little story about Tara. So, yeah, it was way back. <laughs> I can see a doubt coming up in my mind around like the imagining the four elements come like the essence of the four elements coming in and stable and like helping to stabilize or purify, rebalance the elements in my body. Kind of doing the lights to purify from Vajrasattva or that kind of element where I regret a negativity for purification. That makes sense because it's more at a mental level, but doing things that's meant to be physical and these lights just imagining lights and suddenly my body heals itself I'm like oh, that sounds like magic <laughs> that sounds like magic um can you speak on that no <laughs> I just told that story so I mean if we get too analytical and questioning and how does this work and you know sometimes that can interfere with just doing it so Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not in a position to explain how these things work, so don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but they do talk about the power of, of faith and doing doing a practice with faith, with confidence. I mean, I know that's hard <laughs> if you don't have the faith, um, but there's lots of stories about you know, people who just do a practice that they were advised to do by a teacher, and they do it with faith, and it works, they get results. So I think that mind that's questioning and doubting and wondering, how does this work? And if I don't understand how it works, can it still work? You know, it's like wanting to <laughs> um, understand everything. Well, maybe that isn't necessarily helpful. If you know the answer, if you've been given an answer, an explanation, then it makes sense to you, that's fine. But you know, I haven't really, and I haven't found much explanation about how these kind of things work. So I'm not in a position to explain that. So you could still try to ask other teachers, but yeah, I don't know. I can certainly say it it helped with the pain I had while I was doing it. After I came out of it though, it it uh really hit back um as hard as ever, but uh yeah, well, during the practice, at least, I can say firsthand, if you let your if you let yourself really visualize it and visu visualize one thing that helped was, you know, with the rainbow light and nectar, um, vi visualizing the 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 pain really taking on an extra bright rainbow colors <laughs> so it looks like the pain looks pretty um one question i had was uh um so if enlightened beings don't take birth anymore are these uh enlightened beings in the refuge field and and the white tara are they 
um, just for the sake of visualization, or is there some some form of I don't want to call it existence, but some form of agency that there are thought that they are thought to have right now still. Um. Well, with deities like Tara, they seem to be not really beings. I mean, there there is a story about uh, Tara, normally it's green Tara, who was once upon a time a princess during the time of one other Buddha, and she developed bodhicitta and so on and so on. So I'm not sure if that's a real story <laughs> that we need to believe in or if it's more of a legend. I, I don't know. Um, maybe some people can relate to Tara in that way, but you know, another way to relate to Tara is just that she's manifested from the mind of a Buddha. So a Buddha's mind has this ability to just appear in any form at all. It doesn't have to be a person who was once born and then became enlightened, but just taking that form. So that might be an easier way of thinking of the deities like Tara. But then in the refuge field, um, when we're, we're doing um, the practice of refuge and visualizing the objects of refuge, we do visualize um, previous masters, you know, like Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and Lama Tsongkhapa and so on and so forth. So those are people who were, you know, born in this world and lived for a while and attained realizations and taught and wrote texts and so on and then passed away. So are you asking um, if we're visualizing them in that form, you know, do they somehow still exist in that form? I kind of wonder about that myself. <laughs> yeah, because... Um, or in, in any way, do they e exist or have a agency in, in any kind of way? Well, it depends on wh what level they have achieved in their practice. If they have already became enlightened, if they're fully enlightened, then of course they, they well, whatever, whatever, wherever they are, fully enlightened or on the eighth bodhisattva bhumi or on the third bodhisattva bhumi, whatever, you know, level of the path they're on, they're still existing. Their mind is still there in some kind of form, maybe not the same form they had when they were born in India 500, 1,000 years ago. But I think it's more for our benefit to imagine them in that form, the form they had when they were Chandrakirti living in Nalanda Monastery in India. You know, just we don't know what he looks like right now, where he is. <laughs> so we visualize him in that form. But yeah, the, I mean, according to Buddhism, nobody ever goes out of existence. You know, um, when you become a Buddha, when you become an Arhat, you continue to exist. I know there's some uh, Buddhists who believe that, yeah, once you become an Arhat, once you become a Buddha, you pass away, you're gone. You don't exist anymore. But in the Mahayana tradition, that isn't the case. Mind, a mind never goes out of existence. It's always existing in some kind of form. So even when you become a Buddha, even when you become an Arhat, your mind is still existing somewhere, somehow, some form. And in the case of the Buddhas, the you know, fully enlightened beings, Buddhas, they have the ability to be anywhere at any time in any form. <laughs> so they can be in many different forms at the same time. So I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, we in our tradition we believe that, yeah, um, on the way to enlightenment and even after enlightenment, the mind is always existing in some kind of form, in some kind of place. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I don't know if it makes, I don't know if I have the mind to make it make sense uh, <laughs> at, at this point, but um, maybe someday, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask your experience. I was just thinking about this as we were talking about um, you, uh, thinking about white tar as also a purification um, practice. And in my own experience, 
I find that there is a particular deities, there is a definite felt experience that is so subtle. A and what I was, experience? Um, I don't know how to explain a felt, it. A f uh, yeah, a felt, felt ex experience. Felt experience. So then I was thinking about that, like the, the feeling of Vajrasattvas is different than, than Tara. I can't really put it to words, but there's a different essence of uh, during the process. Uh, green Tara, white Tara, they all have this, for me anyway, and I was curious about this experience of um, the practices, the subtlety of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, it's very subtle, and the felt experience of each practice is, is the same, but very different for mm -hmm. me. I don't know if I'm, if anyone else experiences that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I, I, I tend to think it, yeah, each one of us has, a, you know, we have different karma, we have different experiences, different personality, and, and also maybe in previous lives we had connections with some of these practices, and so encountering them again in this life, we feel much closer, um, an affinity and attraction wanting to do that practice. So, uh, yeah, I think everyone has their own personal experiences with different deities and maybe more comfortable with some and not less comfortable with others. And that seems to be completely okay, my understanding, um, that, you know, we don't have to force ourselves to do a practice that we don't feel comfortable with, and if we do feel comfortable with certain practice, go for it. That's, that's how I understand it. Yeah, I think Tara in particular is perhaps easy for female practitioners, because, you know, most of the Buddha figures are male figures, and that can be a little discouraging <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> nice to see, oh, there's a female Buddha, and, and actually Tara promised to always remain in female form, um, particularly to help female practitioners, like a role model. You know, it's good to have a role model. Um, but then there's also stories of um, male practitioners who had a very close connection with Tara, like Atisha. Atisha, a great Indian master who was very important in the history of Buddhism in Tibet. So he had a very strong connection with Tara and, you know, would see Tara, would have visions of Tara, and talk to Tara, ask her advice, and so on. So, um, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, and you do read these stories about different yogis and practitioners and masters having connection with different deities. So, it seems like it is a personal thing, and we have to just find our own uh, connections with with deities. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, visualization, when the text says uh, light rays shine forth from the thumb and hook back all the life force that has been scattered or lost, can you give examples of what we could visualize there? <laughs> also for the you know, power and inspiration of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and those who have attained realization of long life. Yeah, it would be, it would be great if you could give, give examples of what we could visualize. Yeah, well, like I said earlier, I don't really understand the meaning of life force that has been lost. So um, I, I can't really explain that from my own knowledge and experience. So... I just think to myself, okay, if there's any of my life force, my life energy that's out there wandering around, <laughs> lost, scattered, <laughs> bring it back, <laughs> come back, and just imagine it in the form of light or energy or whatever coming back into the tom. So with things like that that you don't really understand, it's best to just do it and feel, okay, through the power of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and Tara, it's happening. Um, so I think that's the best way of dealing with things like that, that we don't understand. Just feel, you know, whether I understand it or not, it's happening. <laughs> and, and then the power and inspiration of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Um, so 
I guess the more you know about the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, their qualities, their abilities, their realizations, then the more you can think about that. But like with the Buddhas, they say there are many, many excellent qualities, but there's three main ones. One is um, their compassion, compassion and love for all living beings without exception, like I was talking about this morning. You know, they don't have anger towards anybody. They have nothing but love and compassion and the wish to help. So try to get a sense of what that would be like. You know, like the best example would be a mother or father with their child. You know, when people bring a child into the world, they're just, they just love their child so much. They want to do everything for their child and take care of their child and just, you know, this incredible love and compassion and dedication. So similar to that kind of love and compassion, the Buddhas feel that for everybody, every living being. And so it's good to like contemplate that and try to get a sense of what that must be like. Um, and then another of their main qualities is wisdom. And the wisdom that the Buddha has uh, sees all phenomena, everything that exists, and sees it correctly without any mistakes. We, we see things incorrectly. We have a lot of confusion and delusions and misconceptions about things. So we see things incorrectly. But in the mind of the Buddha, everything is seen clearly, perfectly, just as it is without any mistake. And it's hard to understand that until you study more and, you know, but yeah, when you do get an understanding of that kind of wisdom, then um, you can think of that coming. And then the third main quality of the Buddhas is their skillful means. Um, that means they have lots of abilities, different kinds of skills and abilities that they can use to help sentient beings, like being able to manifest in different forms. They can appear in any type of form at all. They can appear as ordinary people, you know, a doctor, a teacher, a dog, a cat. <laughs> um, they can appear in people's dreams. They can appear as inanimate objects. They can appear as deities. So they can take these different forms to communicate with and help sentient beings. So that's one of the abilities that they have. And there's lots of others as well, but so, yeah, the more you learn about the Buddhas and their qualities, then you can bring that understanding in and think, okay, all of those abilities and qualities are coming in the form of light and nectar and absorbing into the Tom. And then that is coming into me when I'm reciting the mantra. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. That's all. I wanted to start talking about grief. Um, did you get the slides I sent, the second set of slides? Okay. I was wondering, can you, over there, can you see the screen? Because that plant is in the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Well, I have it on my own screen. Okay, so um, so this topic of grief, um, yeah, it's not really a joyful subject, <laughs> but I think it is important to talk about, to look at, understand more, because it is something we experience in life, and other people experience it. So people we know, our family members, friends, and so on, go through this experience of grief. So it is useful to understand it better and learn ways of uh, managing it, dealing with it, to be able to help ourselves and others. Um, and there's not a lot of information about grief in the Buddhist teaching, so I had to kind of do research and pull things out. Um, so I did that. and. Then, I will also share some material from contemporary sources, psychology, and so on. Um, and yeah, 
So I thought we could start by looking at um, some material from Buddhism about grief. And so this is a portion of the Buddha's first teaching, right? Uh, so he attained enlightenment, and then um, several weeks later gave his first teaching to the these five um, men who had been companions with him during during their practice. They had practiced together, and then they sort of separated, and then when he became enlightened, he went uh, to where they were staying and, and gave them this teaching. So this was his very first teaching after enlightenment. And he explained the, the four truths, four noble truths, and also the Eightfold Path. So... Um, so in this first teaching, this is a quotation from that, um, he first talk, talked about the noble truth of suffering, or uh, what's a better translation of that? Um, yeah, the meaning of noble, it's not that suffering is noble, <laughs> sometimes it sounds like that, but rather the, the reality or the truth of suffering is known by noble beings. Noble beings are those uh, we call aryas, aryas in Sanskrit. These are those who have gained a realization of the true nature of things, who've seen reality. So someone who's gained a direct realization of the truth of things, this is how they see things. They see um, the reality of suffering. Um, so he goes through a list of different kinds of sufferings, or dukkha, Sanskrit term dukkha, unsatisfactoriness that is experienced by unenlightened beings. And he mentions birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief. So grief is on this list of um, common um, experiences of, of suffering, painful experiences that people go through. Um, and then despair, uh, association with the unpleasant, meaning in encountering things that are unpleasant for us. Separation from what is pleasant. So when we have pleasant experiences, we sometimes have to separate from them. People and places and things that we don't want to separate from, but we, we do. Not to get what one wants. So that's another common experience. We have desires, wishes, aspirations for certain things to get or to happen, but we don't always get what we want, and that's painful. And then in brief, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. So the five aggregates is a way of explaining what makes us up. Basically, it's body and mind, having a physical body and then a mind, which has various aspects to our mind. So just having this physical, uh, this, this, sorry, this um, combination of physical and mental components, uh, our five aggregates, just having this itself is suffering because it's like the basis for all kinds of painful experiences, such as sickness, aging, death, and so on. So the Buddha was certainly aware of grief, um, as he mentions here, and that it's something painful. It's one of the many different types of painful experience that we go through in life. Also, um, in the early part of his life, he was a prince, lived a very comfortable life, but then when he was in his 20s, he had four encounters that sort of turned his mind around and led him to want to uh, follow a spiritual path and um, seek enlightenment. So the, the four experiences were seeing someone who was very ill, uh, seeing someone who was very old, and seeing a funeral, a body, being carried through town to the probably the cremation grounds with um, 
the loved ones, the relatives following behind, weeping. So in that experience, he observed grief. It's not clear what, how much, um, if any, grief he may have encountered earlier in his life. It sounds like it, he was surrounded by beautiful young people and all kinds of wonderful experiences. The family really tried their best to shield him from the harsher realities of life. Um, but then, yeah, when he had these different encounters, he came to think about how, yeah, as human beings, we are subject to these different experiences. We get old, we get sick, we die. And, um, and then the fourth encounter he had was with um, a person who was a wandering mendicant, a religious practitioner who, uh, you know, had left home and was dedicating his life to spiritual practice. And he saw that this person looked very peaceful and happy, and um, that inspired him to take up that kind of life himself and find a way to end suffering for himself and for others. Yeah, so grief was one of the things he encountered and became aware of that led to his um, spiritual journey. Um, so here it's mentioned as, as a type of suffering. And when we had this uh, retreat last year, Tukje asked a really good question. Um, if grief was an affliction. So in Buddhism, um, one of the things we learn about are different mental states that are afflicted, that are deluded, that are, you know, incorrect and lead to suffering and problems. So there's lists of these afflictions. And the usual list has, there's six root afflictions and then 20 secondary afflictions. Um, those are the ones we normally study. So grief is not on those lists. It's not listed as a root or a secondary affliction. But I did some further research and I did find it. Um, there's these books, um, uh, a series of books called The Science and Philosophy in Indian Buddhist Classics. So a team of Tibetan scholars um, uh, pulled out uh, information about different topics, and they published it in these books. So there's one of the one of those volumes, volume two, is on the mind, all the different aspects of the mind. And um, so in that book, I did find other lists of mental afflictions, you know, in addition to the usual six and twenty, and I did find grief on uh, a couple of those lists. <laughs> so anyway, the, in short, in, in some of the classical Buddhist texts, um, grief is con uh, considered a mental affliction, a secondary mental affliction. Um, and I thought, maybe not today, but another, maybe tomorrow, um, just to kind of analyze grief and what gives rise to it. You know, what is that mental state and what are the various causes and conditions giving rise to it? <clears throat> Another place where we find grief mentioned is in um, explanations of the four immeasurable thoughts, which one of the prayers that we recite in the sadhana and I gave a little brief explanation this morning, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And, that, and so those uh, four mental states are um, practices or you know, things that are developed in all the Buddhist traditions. And um, mainly in the Theravada tradition, there's explanations of um, with each of these four measurables, there's a near enemy and a far enemy. A near enemy would be a state of mind that looks similar to it, but isn't it. So for example, love or loving, uh, loving kindness, metta. 
um, the near enemy of that is attachment. So attachment can seem similar to love, but it isn't. Yeah, it's, yeah. So that's like, they call it a near enemy. And the far enemy of love is hatred. Um, so then with compassion, it said that the near enemy of compassion is grief. So in um, the book, In Praise of Great Compassion, this is volume five of the series of books Venerable Children has been editing, the Dalai Lama's teachings, uh, and, and so on. So in that book, there's quite an extensive explanation of the four immeasurables and how to develop them. So in that book, it says, compassion's near enemy is personal distress or grief based on worldly life. This grief is the sadness and distress felt when we or those we care about cannot get what we want. It may be sorrow over past frustrations or present disappointments. Uh, grief is similar to compassion in that both have an element of sorrow due to others' misery. So that it kind of can look like compassion, it can appear like compassion. There's some similarity with compassion, but it isn't. And so we need to distinguish grief and compassion. And then the far enemies of compassion are cruelty and violence. So those are states of mind or attitudes that are like totally opposite to compassion because compassion um, wants sentient beings to not suffer and, and wants to protect them from suffering, to relieve them from suffering, whereas cruelty and violence is just the opposite, wanting to give them suffering, wanting to make them suffer. Um, so that explanation also seems to indicate that grief is uh, like a hindrance, something interfering with our spiritual practice, our spiritual development, but also our happiness. Yeah. What is the Tibetan word that is being used for grief? I don't know. Oh, yeah. We'll see if it's in that book. It probably is. It's probably in that book that I mentioned, but I don't know. So, yeah, I guess normally when we talk about grief or think about grief or feel grief, it's related to the loss of a loved one. That's probably the, the, the number one example of grief that we feel when a cherished friend, family member, or pet passes away, we lose them, then that sadness that we feel. But it can, it can happen due to other kinds of loss, such as um, losing a job, losing a home, losing a body part, right? So if you have to have some part of your body amputated or removed surgically, then you know that can lead to grief. Um, losing some possession that you have, losing an aspect of your health. Yeah, you used to be really healthy and now you're sick all the time, so loss of health, loss of some ability, something you used to be able to do and are no longer able to do. I once met a woman who told me that she used to play the cello and that was her number one joy in life. She just loved playing the cello. And then she developed some disability with her hands, I guess, and wasn't able to play anymore. And it was really so devastating for her. And she took up meditation <laughs> to, you know, to deal with that as a, as a remedy for that. So that's how she got into meditation. But yeah, it sounded like it was really, really painful for her to lose that ability, which was such a source of, of enjoyment for her. Um, and even on a, you know, on a daily basis, there might be experiences we have that are maybe not grief, but similar to grief. 
you know, like when your team loses the game or you order something from Amazon and it, it arrives and it's not quite what you expect. <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't call that grief. <laughs> Maybe disappointment. But it's kind of similar. Grief and disappointment are kind of, yeah, there was some expectation of something and that was dashed. <laughs> that was not fulfilled. What else? What other experiences that we have that are sources of grief? When there's been trust betrayed in a, a friendship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or someone that you're really close to, they move away, like they're your closest friend, and they move across the country, across the world. Mm -hmm. Or your child, <laughs> family member. Hmm? Yeah, Venerable Tsipa has a. I wonder if there's collective grief over something like the COVID pandemic, where it's, it's sort of a loss of innocence, you know, that the generations that are alive now, most of them haven't experienced something of that caliber. And so mm. there was there were a lot of losses during that pandemic in terms of social interactions and jobs and all sorts of things. Um, and also I spoke with a woman recently who was still grieving the loss of her father because she wasn't able to be there with him when he died because of the COVID lockdown. Mm. Um, so there's probably still a lot of either conscious or unconscious grief related to the pandemic, I would imagine. Hey, Grace, where's the microphone? <clears throat> I think another, uh, well, there is another type of grief that is the planetary grief, uh, people feeling the changing planet and the way things are changing on our world and the Earth, global climate change, Mm. Um, the loss of environment. <clears throat> I could see when um, a political party loses or, you know, the candidate is elected that people didn't want, they have grief. Mm -hmm. And also, like, war, I think, seeing what's going on in the Middle East causes a lot of grief to arise. Would it be helpful to define grief or the concept <laughs> out of curiosity for myself? Too. Yeah, good question. Well, what is a definition of grief? I can look it up in my computer dictionary. There's probably not just one definition that everyone agrees on, but the Oxford Dictionary is usually pretty good. So grief is intense sorrow, especially caused by someone's death. And also an instance or cause of intense sorrow. Yeah. So that's a feeling of intense sorrow. I don't know, like in Buddhism, how it's defined. Actually, I did find something. I was looking in the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification. Mm -hmm. There's an explanation of grief. Okay, grief. So this is from Visuddhi Magga, Path of Purification, which was written by um, Buddha Gosha in what century? Fifth century, something long time ago. And it's a very important text in the Theravada tradition, all about the path and um, transformation of the mind uh, to nirvana. Okay, so this says, grief is mental pain. Its characteristic is mental oppression. Its function is to distress the mind. It is manifested as mental affliction. 
It is suffering because it is inten- intrinsic suffering <laughs> and because it brings bodily suffering. For those who are gripped by mental pain, uh, oh, for those who are gripped by mental pain, tear their hair, weep, thump their breasts, and twist and writhe. They throw themselves upside down, use the knife, swallow poison, hang themselves with ropes, walk into fires, and undergo many kinds of suffering. That does happen sometimes. People have such intense grief that they try to kill themselves, they do kill themselves, or they harm themselves, um, they writhe on the floor, you know, wailing, crying. So, yeah, it can afflict the body as well as the mind. So that's another explanation of grief. So it's intense mental pain and, uh, yeah. There's something else I found about grief, about causes of grief. I wanted to comment on uh, Venerable uh, Seppel's, um, what she said. It seems like a loss of connection around COVID has caused a lot of grief. My, My granddaughter who was in high school went through a COVID time period and they were isolated. They had to stay at home, and the school said, well, you can come back. (laughs) And the school said, well, you can come back. And so she came back, but she had to wear a mask, and she couldn't hug any of her friends. It was was like being separate. It was a whole different thing. So uh, that loss of connection, and it seems like with other people, there was a lot of loss of connection with COVID, with the COVID time. I was wondering if we could maybe discuss or draw a distinction between grief and personal distress, because oftentimes we discuss personal distress as the near enemy of um, compassion. It seems like that gets more more discussion, at least at the Abbey. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm just kind of wondering if there is a line between the two and what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, when when it said that personal distress is the near enemy of compassion, I think that is when we observe suffering. Either we see it directly in front of us or we hear about it. So we hear about suffering and we just get very distressed about it. There's worry, there is anxiety. I mean, of course, there's a certain amount of empathy. We are concerned about this person or these people who are suffering and want to benefit them, but we just get kind of overly emotional and it's not very effective. We don't really think of constructive solutions. That's how I understand personal distress. So that isn't the meaning of compassion. Ideally, compassion is more clear focused, um, rational, (laughs) I mean, there's still feeling there, but you're able to put your energy into constructive actions to help, to bring about relief um, of of suffering. You're able to act to help the person in need rather than just getting all flustered and anxious and so on. That's how I understand it. I, I don't know if there's other explanations of that. Shiva, where's the... Yeah, it seems like um, personal distress can often arise over um, temporary conditions, whereas grief is usually um, dealing with a situation that is no longer um, remediable. Mm -hmm. So we might not have skill to address the suffering that gives rise to personal distress, but when somebody dies, you can't bring them back to life. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just one thought is it may appear like compassion because let's say it's a loved one and they're suffering for a while from disease and then they, they pass away. And so we do feel concern about them 
and their suffering and their death and you know wish that this wasn't happening to them um, but in reality maybe a lot of that suffering is personal yeah that it's painful for us to see them suffer and it's painful for us that they are no longer there uh, as we would like them to be in our life um, because we get a lot of benefit from our friends and our loved ones and so on so it's a personal loss but we might you know not recognize that self-centered element of it and and think oh we're concerned about them that's why we're suffering it's because of their suffering but that may be why yeah it can appear like compassion but it it it's not really so I'd like to maybe carry on and I'll think about it more and tomorrow try to give a from the Buddhist point of view what would be the evolution of grief as I understand it how it comes about but um yeah, in, in contemporary sources, I, I looked this up online, they, they explain different types of grief. Um, one is called anticipatory grief. Uh, so in this type of grief, you experience loss before it occurs. This can happen when you learn a loved one has a terminal illness, for example. So I can completely relate to that because I that's what I felt when my mother was diagnosed with fourth stage cancer, you know, and it was just a matter of time. So I was already feeling grief just knowing that, you know, she wasn't going to be there much longer. You know? So that's anticipatory grief. And then there's something called delayed grief, when you don't process your feelings at the time of your loss. Instead, you feel and process them weeks, months, or years later. This may happen because the shock of your loss interrupts your ability to deal with grief, or maybe you're so busy with practical matters that you don't have time to feel grief until a later point in time. And actually, there was a question here on the table, first thing this morning, <laughs> saying, can you speak about how to uncover grief that feels blocked? Like, I want to process it, but I can't access the feelings. I just feel kind of numb. So that sounds like maybe um, delayed grief. Um, and I haven't really thought a lot about this question, but one thing that comes to my mind is that I don't think you can force things, you know? You can't apply some conception about how it should be, how I should feel, how I should proceed through this experience. Because I think everyone's experience is different. Everyone's experience of grief will be different from everyone else's. And even you yourself, you know, depending on who it is that you lose, what your relationship was with them, and so on, various factors the the kind of grief you would feel with each loss will also be different. So I don't think it would be helpful to have this fixed idea of I should be feeling this, I should be doing that, and it's not happening, what's wrong? I think it's better to just allow things to take their natural course, you know? So, yeah, just... Uh, yeah, when the time is right, those feelings will come up and you'll be able to deal with them and process them. That's my thought. I don't know if anyone else has anything to share with that. You've had an experience like that. I can share that when my mother's mother died, um, and they had a difficult relationship, but also very, very close, difficult relationship. But anyway, my mom was very practical. She was, you know, she, she handled it the way she did. And she also grieved someone at that moment. But um, 10 years passed, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. She was dealing with the loss of her mother over this time, but it wasn't a big part of her life. And then one day she opened a drawer looking for, I don't know, a pair of scissors or something. That, and, and in that drawer was a pair of her mother's glasses. 
seeing her mother's glasses, suddenly she took those glasses in her hands and she finally grieved the loss of her mother at a really deep level. And it was completely natural. It was like the time was finally right that she could deal with it at that point. But it took 10 years. And you know, it, it, I don't think she ever was kind of uncomfortable about that. It was like, wow, this, is, this has been there all this time. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I know. Now it's, now it's ripe. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, that's my thought. Just don't worry about it. And when the time is right, then that will come. And hopefully you'll have the means to deal with it. <clears throat> so I'm reading a book right now. I'm I'm only part way through, but it's called um, "It's Okay That You're Not Okay," <laughs> and it's written by a woman who's she's a psych psychotherapist, but she also had a really devastating experience of loss. Her partner died uh, in a drowning incident, and she was there witnessing it, and it was just like sent her into an abyss and um, so it was really painful for her but she also found that the kind of things that people say when they know you've lost someone are often really off the wall and just just make things worse and also even so-called grief support groups, grief counselors, you know, they also have it wrong. <laughs> and so, yeah, she's she's trying to point out um, that, yeah, our cultural attitudes about grief and our way of dealing with grief are really broken, really, you know, messed up. And um, and this kind of this is one example that she gives because uh, there's this notion of stages of grief. Um, there's different numbers, seven, five. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is one person who came up with an explanation of stages of grief. So the, the, the medical traditions, psychologists, sociologists, and so on have taken this on. And they use this to sort of gauge where people are at. You know, it's kind of like imposing this template of stages of grief onto people. And that can become very, it's inappropriate. Because not everybody goes through all those stages, and they don't go through them in the same way at the same time. And that can sometimes make things worse for people, because then they feel, or they're told, you know, you're, you're not moving through this fast enough, you're getting stuck, and so on and so forth. So she's, I haven't finished the book, but she's basically saying that, yeah, often in our society, doctors, sociologists, psychologists, people in helping professions, and also just ordinary people often have kind of distorted ideas and ways of dealing with people who are going through grief. So at the end of the book, she gives advice on what does help. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. But, but yeah, I was just reminded of that because if you do have this notion of stages of grief and you're looking at your experience and thinking, I'm not going through this in the way I should be according to these stages of grief, it's not helpful. Yeah. So it's, it's better not to have those kind of notions and just let things happen in their own time. Let your mind process this experience in the way it needs to. Okay, another type of grief is called traumatic grief. Uh, when the loss is sudden and unexpected, for example, a car accident or a suicide, here people can get stuck in the trauma and have trouble processing the grief. And they may also have PTS, PTSD symptoms. So, so it's just pointing out that because of different factors, then there are different ways that grief can be experienced. Um, and then in addition to those factors, each one of us has our own experiences and our relationships with the person who passed away or whatever it is we've lost, and their age and the cause of death and so on. So all these different factors would influence 
how we experience grief. I also think, this is something I came up with, and you might disagree, but let's go through it anyway. I think that the way we experience grief can also be affected by the views that we have about life, death, the purpose of life, and so on. So the next slide. Um, yeah, different people have different ideas about life us, the world, where do we come from, how did we get here, why are we here? <laughs> so, yeah, I just came up with these three general ideas about that that, that people tend to have. Um, so many people in the world believe in a creator. Um, there's some sort of very powerful and very loving creator who created the world, who created us. And so that creator gives life, but also takes it away. And uh, so for some people who have strong faith, strong belief in this, this, this kind of notion, when they lose a loved one, they probably have some suffering, some grief. But they may think, well, this is the will of God. This is God's will. He has a plan. He knows best. And that gives them a certain amount of comfort. Not necessarily, but <laughs> I think for many people, then, yeah, it gives them some kind of answer, some kind of explanation as to why, why this death has happened. On the other hand, uh, experiencing a death or a tragedy can cause some people to lose their faith in God because they think this just, they can't reconcile this tragedy with the notion of a loving God. How could a loving God allow this to happen? And probably one of the strongest examples of that, Eli Weissel, um, who was in Auschwitz when he was 15 years old with his whole family, his whole village. Well, not his whole village, but all the Jews in his village were transported to Auschwitz. 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 Sorry. And uh, he wrote a book about his experiences called Night. So he said when he arrived in Auschwitz with his family, um, there was this, the first thing that happens when they get off the train is there's a separation. Um, some people go to the right, some people go to the left. And I think the people going to the left are headed for death right away. And the ones going to the right will be, will be kept alive to work uh, for the Nazis. So he and his father went to the right, his mother and sister went to the left and never saw them again. And um, so as he, he and his father and the other men on the right side were being marched to their barracks, he saw this, um, yeah, this pit full of fire, and then a truck backed up to the pit, and the back of the truck was full of little babies, children, and they were just thrown into this pit of fire. So he said, um, never shall I forget that night, those flames that consumed my faith forever those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. So before that time, he was intensely religious. You know, he was studying the Torah. Is it? <laughs> Not the Quran, <laughs> Torah. Um, yeah, the Jewish scriptures and really practicing, really, really, he was incredibly religious. But that experience, he, he just couldn't have faith in God anymore after seeing that, that event. <clears throat> and I knew a, I know a man in Spain who got polio when he was five years old and left him unable to walk properly. And he said, due to when that happened, his grandfather lost his faith in God. He just couldn't accept how a loving God could allow a little kid to be sick like that and be, you know, become disabled. So those are just some examples of how people sometimes lose faith when there's a tragedy, they, they can't explain. It doesn't make sense anymore that there could be a loving God. So, yeah, 
For some people, that works. For some people, it doesn't. Um, okay, another view people have is um, life is just a natural occurrence due to causes and conditions. So probably a lot of people nowadays believe in that because of the influence of science. Um, so they don't believe in a creator. They just believe in the laws of nature. So we start off as a zygote in our womb, and at some point there's consciousness arising in our brain, and then we go through life, and then at a certain point we die, and our brain dies, consciousness dies, everything's finished, nothing remains. Okay, so it's just natural causes and conditions, physical causes and conditions um, that, you know, are responsible for life. So I don't know many people who have such views and talk to them, um, so I don't really know how having that, of, that kind of view would affect they, the way they deal with loss. I suppose they just say it's bad luck, you know, when a young person dies, a tragedy happens, it's just bad luck, it's just misfortune, but there's no reason, no explanation other than that. So I'm not sure how they would, exp yeah, how that would affect the way they deal with it. Um, so some might find comfort in that that view, that explanation of things. Others might feel the world is crazy and <laughs> nothing makes any sense. I don't know. <clears throat> well, uh, regarding this, uh, uh, in Hong Kong, when I study uh, Buddhist counseling, uh, they have Buddhist counselor for dealing with dress, and there are two types of people. The first type people who are devout, uh, devout uh, Buddhist practitioner, they will be advised to uh, turn their grief into compassionate arts, uh, just at the city Gabraha Sutra. Uh, during the first uh, 49 days, they will do as many uh, good deeds as they can and dedicate the good deeds for their beloved one. And for those who are non-Buddhist or even Buddhist, but they they feel so shocked about the the loss of the loved one, they will come to the Buddhist counseling center, and uh, typically the Buddhist counselor will explain uh, about the four noble truths, the the first uh, the truth about the aging, and death uh, by the 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 two arrow sutra. Uh, because uh, aging and death is unavoidable. That is the first arrow. And then uh, concerning risk, it is the second arrow. And they try to change their perspective, perspective. And I think that most of the case that they consulted, it was successful after 10 or 12 sessions. Uh, first, they acknowledge the risk of the, the one who who lost their beloved, and gradually their, their perspective change, and they can overcome the grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Let, me, let me just continue, um, because the third um, view <laughs> is the, the Buddhist view. Um, and, and so according to Buddhism, um, uh, this I mean, it's quite complicated, but probably most of you are familiar. The Buddhist explanation of, of where life comes from is uh, karma and afflictions, basically. Um, the mind has been existing a really long time. It didn't just start in this lifetime, but we had many previous lives. And this mind has not been enlightened it was never enlightened. It was always afflicted with karma and, and afflictions. And it's because of karma and afflictions that we create the causes to take rebirth. And so this life that we have now is the result of um, karma we created in the past. Although it's good karma, it's virtuous karma, because we're human beings. Um, and to be born as a human being, we have to create virtue. We have to live ethically and 
be generous and so on. So we must have created really good karma in past lives to have the life we have now. But it's still afflicted in the sense that we still have ignorance about the true nature of things. And that's why we are reborn again and again instead of being enlightened or attaining nirvana. Um, so, so the Buddhist view is, um, yeah, life doesn't come from a creator and, and it's not just random arising from, um, you know, physical material things like the brain. Um, but, um, yeah, it's the result of these causes, which are faulty causes. And so what that means is, yeah, because the causes of this life that we are in are faulty, they're afflicted, they're, you know, contaminated with karma, then life itself, this life that we have itself is faulty, afflicted. It's not like pure and wonderful and fantastic and perfect. And so it's only natural that we experience um, painful things like sickness and aging and death and difficulty getting along with people and not always getting things we want and losing things we love and so on and so forth. So all the various types of sufferings or unsatisfactory experiences that we have in life, these are all the result of these causes of karma and afflictions. And the main cause is ignorance about the true nature of things. So that's just briefly um, how a Buddhist would understand where life comes from. And so I think that, yeah, as a Buddhist, um, with that understanding of the Buddhist teachings, that understanding of, you know, how life comes about, that there would still be feelings of grief when losing loved ones, when losing cherished possessions and so on. There would, you know, be sadness, painful experiences. Um, <clears throat> but I think that we would find comfort in our spiritual beliefs and practices, that we would have practices that we can do, as, as Venerable just pointed out. Uh, there's sutras we can recite, mantras we can do, meditations we can do, and so on, that can um, help our mind be in a more positive state rather than just kind of drowning in, in grief. And, and also just knowing that suffering isn't something permanent. The situation of being unenlightened, being in samsara, isn't a permanent situation that's going to last forever. But it's possible for each and every one of us to become free of this situation. And so putting our energy into that, putting our energy into doing the things that will enable us to be free and help others to be free as well. So there's various things we can do, as Venerable mentioned, to, to work with situations of loss, and painful situations. So even if there's grief, we can still work with that. And there's, I'll talk more about that. What are some of the practices we can do when we're experiencing loss so that it, you know, we can even transform such experiences into the path, into our spiritual practice such that they will help us progress further on the path. So I guess the point I was trying to make here is that um, depending on how you understand life and the world and where we come from and, and so on and so forth, that would probably affect the way you uh, respond when experiencing some experience like loss, loss of a loved one, or loss of something valuable and cherished. So this is just my thoughts, and you know, you can think about it, we can talk about it more tomorrow. We've come to the end of our time for this session. And there may be other views as well that I don't, you know, I didn't think of here. Other kind of world views about life and the world and everything. But I thought these are probably the main ones that most people would um, hold to. And also, mainly in this course, in this retreat, we're going to be looking at Buddhist views of things, Buddhist explanation of things, and also Buddhist practices that we can use to deal with painful experiences. 
but then um, after last last year's course, one one person made the comment that it would be good to look at ways that we could help other people who are not Buddhist, as as Venerable mentioned, you know. So people in our life, family and friends and so on, who don't have the Buddhist worldview, what can we do to help them when they're experiencing grief? So I can pull some things out of that book that I'm reading, <laughs> try to read faster and get to the end. But she's somebody with experience. She knows what doesn't work and what does work. And in fact, she started a whole organization called Refuge in Grief to try to help people who are going through an experience of grief and are not finding much help from uh, their friends and family and even counselors. So she has some methods that do seem to work. Can you also talk a little bit about this uh, quotation that you pulled for the Buddhist first teaching? Because the, from what it says, this is the grief is part of suffering, which is the resultant state. And it's, if it's an affliction, then it's the causal state. So what are you asking? How? how talk about grief as an affliction and grief as an experience of suffering. Yeah, because this, uh, this quotation that you have, it's mm -hmm. part of that which is the resultant state. And then your example of the near enemy of the compassion, that would pr put it as a causal state? I don't know if we need to differentiate it in that way. I mean, when we experience grief, it's painful. It is an ex you know, in a painful experience. And we probably experience it over a period of time, on and off. But, you know, the question that had come up last year from Tukche was, is it also an affliction? And that's something I had never thought about before, never heard about before. So I'm just, I was pulling out information that, yes, it, it is an affliction as well. So it's both a suffering, an experience of suffering, and an affliction. Which is, I think, true for most of the afflictions, you know, like jealousy. Jealousy is an affliction. It's also very painful when you're experiencing it. So, um, so I think I don't I don't see any contradiction in saying that it's both a suffering and an affliction. But maybe we can talk about this more later. Okay, so let's dedicate the merit of this session. And to the enlightenment of all living beings, may all living beings become free of all their sufferings, including the suffering of grief. And, um, and we can also think of our precious teachers, various teachers who are teaching us, but also teachers of others, spiritual teachers who are benefiting so many people in the world. So may they all have good health and live very long lives. <laughs>